Good morning and welcome to Gladney University. My name is Jennifer Lanter and I work at the Gladney Center for Adoption in the Education Department. I am really excited about our presentation today and I can't wait to tell you all about it and all about our speaker. But first I have just a couple of little housekeeping things for you. Um, just remember that your CEU, I uh, like to get your CEUs at the end of this presentation, like a little, um, a little box will pop up and you just click on that and start filling that out and submit or if you miss that opportunity an hour later um, you'll receive an email with the link and just click on that and fill out that information for us and you'll get your ceu seven to ten business days um, after submission i want to thank you so much for joining us today this is a really important topic and we're also in the midst of national adoption month so this is a big month for the gladney center for adoption as we're celebrating all kinds of um, all kinds of adoptions and all kinds of families and we celebrate those stories and we honor um, the pain and joy that can coexist in adoption. We have a big group with us today, which is also exciting. I love that. We want this presentation to be as um, to get, we want you to get as much out of it as possible. So if you have any questions, we encourage you to ask them. Please put those in your question box um, and we'll make sure that we get those answered by Nancy. I can't wait to tell you a little bit about Nancy, but I first wanna tell you about why the topic that we're discussing today is so important. Um, um, so right now we're going to be talking about adoption in that hospital setting, a, a social worker's perspective. And so um, why that's so important is because in the adoption process, as you can imagine, when we are working with um, someone who may be planning adoption or maybe someone who hasn't yet decided that adoption may be the right course for them, then um, there's a lot of there's a lot that goes into that decision. And a hospital social worker can be a very important person in that process. Um, it seems the the patient or the client has basically a few roads to choose from at that moment, and someone that can help explain her options to her can put her in a very very important um, put her on a very important path to her baby's future and for her future as well. Nancy, our speaker today, comes with us with over 24 years experience. She is um, a licensed clinical social worker and she's been working for mom with moms and babies for almost that entire time. I'm gonna let her tell you a little bit more about herself. So um, I'm really excited to be able to talk to you about this very important topic. Um, Social workers, when we work in hospitals, as I, you know, we're working in a host setting and we're typically the only uh, mental health professional social worker that is on a floor. It is largely, of course, made up of medical personnel. So you're working with, you know, physicians and nurses who uh, may not have the same perspective as we do. So one of the challenges for a a medical social worker in a large hospital setting is that you're bringing a different perspective to the floor. And um, when you bring in adoption into there, then it brings multiple perspectives because you're often working with the birth mother and birth father, perhaps, and you're working with adoptive parents. Um, you're working with an adoption agency. You're working with the nurses. Um, and so you're kind of like the point person and you're having to manage a lot of different perspectives, which is one of the challenges, I think, for being in this position. Most hospitals do have um, in their protocols that the social workers are the ones who manage the process. So um, we, of course, know that 
deciding to place a baby for adoption is a huge life-changing event for everyone who's involved. And it's a very um, scary time. It's a uh, very, there's a lot of emotions going on. There's a lot of different perspectives going on. Um, and so it's important for the social worker to be managing those aspects. There's also ethical and legal aspects that as, an a, as a representative of the hospital system that we have to bring into the situation as well. So I kind of look at adoptions um, very much as kind of having multiple balls in the air and having to constantly be checking in with everyone and putting on sort of different hats as you go through the process. I do think the, the bottom line for everyone involved is that it is life-changing. It is life-changing for the birth mother. Um, it is for her family, as well as for the adoptive um, parents. So let's go to the next one. So we're gonna just, we're gonna talk very briefly, just very wide topic, types of adoptions, kind of um, who the biological mother um, tends to be what her demographics are, um, what the bi who the biological parents are, just very slightly on Texas laws related to pregnancy, difficult choices, some of the emotional and psychological considerations. That is important because um, uh, this is not a just a transaction. It is life changing, and when a mother places a child for adoption, it not it affects the rest of her life. It also affects every pregnancy that she ever has, and she deals with that grief throughout her life span. And then what happens when a biological mother decides to parent, um, changes her mind there, and then managing the process in the facility. Okay, next. Um, just very quickly, so adoption is has really changed quite a bit over the last 70 years. Um, in the 50s, it was very secretive kind of situation where the baby was taken away from the mom, typically at delivery. Um, she never knew anything about who the birth parents were. Um, they were basically told these moms just to go on as if nothing had ever happened, as if that were possible. And um, there were just a very much of a impenetrable wall between the birth mother and the adoptive parents. And then um, the other thing is that adoptees as adults were not seen as perhaps having adoption related issues and have um, you know, some emotional aspects that they need to consider throughout their lives. Today, I'm happy to say it's a much more open and honest kind of um, process. Um, very often the birth mother, birth parents are um, allowed to be at the, par at the adoptive parent's discretion to be a part of the child's life. Um, I think there is a misnomer that uh, birth parents will want to be involved with the child the rest of their lives. And what typically actually happens is initially for you know, the first year or so, you know, there's more interaction and communication, um, and that tends to tail off as they move on with their own lives. Um, but I think that it's also that we have come to recognize that for adoptees, it is important for them to understand where they came from and understand uh, and have, if they choose as adults, to have contact with both families. Next. So, uh, just real quickly, uh, just the statistics here, 38% private adoptions, 37% foster adoptions, and those are adoptions typically where CPS has become involved with the family for whatever reason, and the child is actually placed out of that system into an adoptive home, and then 25% international adoptions. Next. Um, who are the adoptive families? 70% of the adoptive families are married. Uh, 1.6 are unmarried. And of those, 22% uh, single females and 5% single males. I'm actually really excited to see this. Um, you know, families are not just the nuclear family that we grew up thinking about. Um, families look 
in a variety of ways. And I'm very excited that we've had so many different options opening up for children um, to go into loving homes. And we're not just prevented by whether someone's married or not. Um, what I found is that a lot of those single females and males have very large communities of support and extended family that really welcome these children into their homes. Next. So the biological mothers, um, majority of women who do place their children for adoption are in their 20s and 30s. And it has been a very difficult decision. Um, I think that there is a myth that is a, it is a casual decision that someone makes. And I can assure you it is not. It is one that has typically been very, very painful to have to come to, to odds with. Um, they're often already raising at least one child of their own, and and it is kind of it is the culmination of recognizing that they cannot raise another child because they either don't have the financial means, maybe they don't have support of family, maybe they don't have the emotional bandwidth, or maybe just perhaps their lives are not at a place where they're able to really focus on a baby and a child as they truly want to. Um, I talk about this a little bit later, but um, one of the things that I've done a lot of, I did a lot of training with the nurses about was the language that we use in the hospital because it's extremely important. It isn't giving up your child for adoption. Um, it is placing a child for adoption because I think that gets at the heart of what it truly is, which is making what is probably one of the most sacrificial decisions to give your child the best life that you can um, and it's not done casually or anything like that. So um, I always worked with the staff about placing, you know, using the correct words because when the nurses would go into the rooms um, and it was when the mothers would come in and we knew that it was an adoption, I would flag it for the nurses on the floor so that they could tailor their language when they were in there with moms because they spent a lot more time in the mother's room doing nursing care, et cetera. And it was very important to, for them to be using the language um, and to also do a search for themselves, these nurses, about how they felt about adoptions. Um, I had more than one nurse along the years um, have their own issues with adoption and would come in with, well, why is this mother giving her baby away? And we would have to sit down and talk through that. And I would give her kind of a perspective of what was going on. But um, that was something that I always really monitored because it's it was very important that everyone who was along the continuum of care um, was on the same page and was providing support to this birth mom. Next. So um, some myths and facts. Um, there's the myth that most of these birth parents are teenagers. Um, and actually, most of them are high school graduates in their 20s. Only about 25% of birth parents are teenagers. Um, I think that part of the reason for this, it's kind of twofold. Um, it is the decision to be able to place your child for adoption is one that requires a level of maturity and the ability to put, you know, uh, another being first. And you know, de developmentally, it's very difficult for teenagers to do. Um, they also typically will have some unrealistic ideas about what it would be like um, to actually parent a child. I would often just talk to teenagers in general and they're like, well, yes, I'm gonna get a job and I'm gonna go to school full time and I'm gonna take care of my baby. And um, you know, I had to, I was kind of had to be the face of, or the voice of reality for them. Um, the other part about this though, is there's off when it's a teenager, there is a lot of extended family, particularly parents, um, pressure to keep babies um, and to just raise them within the family system. And whether or not that was in the best interest for the baby and in the best interest for the teenager. Um, that most birth parents are drug users, um, that is, Absolutely not true. Um, there are some parent, biological parents who do have issues with 
drug use, but no more so than our general population. Um, everyone has their own unique story. Next. Um, birth parents giving up their babies because they don't care about them. And I touched just a little bit on this. Most of them, this is a very hard decision for them to make. It is one that they have really, really wrestled with. Um, one of the things I would often tell the nurses because they would contact me and say, we have this birth mother and she's, she's in there crying. We think she wants to change her mind. And, uh, you know, this is a grieving process. You know, the decision to place your baby is the decision that you're not going to be parenting your child to adulthood. And of course, there's going to be grief and loss that's going to be associated with that. And, and so that was another important thing to, for me to train the nurses on and to educate them about. Um, but no, this is not a casual decision ever for these parents. Um, even for the mothers that I would have come into the hospital that, for the nurses, it felt like they literally, the first time they'd thought about adoption was when they came into labor and delivery, typically with unplanned pregnancies. Um, I don't really actually believe that, but I think that denial about pregnancies and denial that, you know, well, eventually at the end of nine months, I have to make a decision. I think when it, of course, you're in labor and delivery and you're about to have a baby, it really, it hits you. Those are some of the more difficult cases because we're having to compress what is normally taken place with an adoption agency over, let's say, six months into a two to three day hospital stay. But um, that was something that I had to be comfortable doing. Next. Um, that birth parents want to drop their babies off and never see them again. Um, that is not true, particularly now as we, as the public knows more about adoption. Most birth parents do want to have some contact with their child and it's something that they come to a agreed upon um, in terms of frequency and extent um, with the adoptive parents. And the research is that it is helpful for um, adoptees, um, at least when they reach adulthood and maybe even in their teen years, of course, this is case by case, it is actually good for them in terms of their um, emotional well-being and just in terms of knowing their, uh, their life story. Um, sometimes biological parents don't realize that adoption is the best choice for them and they, they need help. Um, we never want a biological parent to feel like they're pressured into placing their child for adoption. However, it is very important, particularly when I would have mothers that came into the hospital. Um, I mean, I would have mothers that would come in and tell me they didn't even know they were pregnant, which if you've ever had a baby is kind of hard to believe, but I do know that denial is a very strong defense mechanism. Um, it was my, one of my roles in the hospital then was to educate them about the full range of options. And particularly if they had a situation where they were not mentally or emotionally ready to take on a baby to, to talk with them that adoption would be an option for them. Um, and, and what we would always try to do in the hospital, and there is a little bit of a power disparity between adoptive parents who tend to be well-educated um, or at least be of means and have, um, have made a lot of, of more stabilizing decisions in their life, I guess is the best way to put it. And then you have the birth mother. It was very important to me that the birth mother felt that her needs and her rights and her voice was being expressed evenly with the adoptive parents. One of the things I've always really appreciated about agency adoptions over necessarily private adoptions, which we'll very quickly talk about later, um, is that with agency adoptions, there tends to be a caseworker who's assigned to the birth mother and a caseworker who's assigned to the adoptive parents. Their needs are very different um, and 
this way, the birth mother feels like she has someone who is advocating for her, who knows her and can speak up for her. Next. Um, there, is a, there is a myth out there that most people are gonna change their mind um, after they place their baby for adoption. And um, I will say it, particularly in the cases where an adoption agency has been working with a birth mother for a period of time, um, it's less than 2% of birth mothers actually change their minds. Um, it can be very complicated legally, and I'll talk more briefly about this. When a birth mother decides that she wants to place her child for adoption in the hospital, um, it cannot be done until the baby, is, until 48 hours after delivery, and that is to make sure that she doesn't have any medications on board that assisted in delivery and make sure that she has a clear mind and is making her own decision. But it is, um, in most cases, the affidavit of relinquishment is irrevocable. So it is a very um, important decision that she is able to make with a clear mind. Um, the birth mothers, if they're going to change their mind, it happens before after delivery and before that affidavit takes place. I would say in about a quarter of the cases, well, actually probably even less than that, would I ever have mom say, yes, I know I wanted to place my baby for adoption, but I've changed my mind. I've looked at my child. I just can't do it. You know, and one of the things that um, I would do is talk with them about, because prior to them delivering, um, I would talk with them about what their reasoning was, and I would remind them about these things after the baby was there sitting in front of them because it became real at that point. Um, but I would talk with them about that in the hospital. Um, it is really, um, those are very devastating cases. They're difficult for the birth mothers because they are typically not set up to be able, they don't have anything to take care of the baby. They haven't really thought through any of that. It's also very devastating for the adoptive parents, which as I mentioned at the beginning, one of the challenges in this role in the hospital is that you are trying to manage the emotional state of a lot of sometimes two different parties that are coming from two different perspectives. I've had to provide support to those adoptive families who, for whom the birth mother changed her mind after delivery, and it's devastating. And realizing that for many of these birth parents, I mean, these adoptive parents, this had happened to them before. And so they already were, you know, it's already a very difficult, tense situation, and you're trying to meet their needs, and you're trying to meet the needs of the biological mother as well. Um, so that is something also that adoptive parents, um, you know, receive counseling about because until, uh, once a child goes into the adoptive home, um, it typically, at least in Texas, um, the, the courts do not rule it as permanent, um, and for six months. So, um, you know, that's another important thing. Counseling for the birth mother during pregnancy, again, I feel like is extremely critical um, and it's extremely critical for after the adoption. Again, um, and I, I have to say, um, and it's not just because I'm doing this for Gladney, but I do have a um, preference for agency adoptions because of the wide range of services and emotional support and counseling that is done prenatally and more importantly, postnatally for the uh, birth mother. So um, next. Um, so different ways in Texas for adoptions, um, placement through CPS, Texas Department of Family Protective Services. Um, those are typically, when a CPS has become involved with the family, um, with parents, um, these can be, typically be older kids and they're typically um, relative placements. 
placement by a licensed agency, um, placement by the child's birth parents, which is a private adoption, which I've alluded to really briefly. It's basically an attorney um, comes in and does the paperwork and um, represents many times the interest of adoptive parents. Part of the ethical, I've had, I had situations where I would have a attorney that would, we would not be alerted that it was an adoption until in one situation I'm thinking about in particular, labor and delivery was not told that it was an adoption because basically the attorney had counseled everybody not to mention it to any of the nursing staff. And um, so mom had the baby and then she was over in labor and delivery floor or on the postpartum floor. And I got a 911 call because mom had, the biological mother had changed her mind and the attorney was in her room. I felt like trying to pressure her into her decision. And then you had adoptive parents in the hallway bordering on hysteria. And this right here is one of the, <laughs> that right there kind of formed my opinion about when, um, and this is not every private attorney, but private attorneys also don't tend to have any notion that this is, um, I'll just say it, it was, it's not just a transaction. It's not just a, um, you know, we're handing this baby over and then the mother, biological mother trots off and she's just fine for the rest of her life. And when I walked into the room, you had this very young attorney kind of, you know, you had a very upset birth mother and you had a very young attorney kind of in the middle of chaos. So, um, and he was adamant that he was going to be representing the interests of the birth mother as well as the adoptive parents, which is a conflict of interest. So, um, you know, that's when I talked about earlier that I, that there is an ethical and a legal aspect to what I did. Um, that was one of those situations where, you know, because actually the hospital is a party to what is going on. So it's very important for me as a representative of the hospital to make sure that everything that is happening is ethical and above board and legal. The other aspect is I would have nurses from time to time ask me if they could adopt a baby that was on the floor, which of course is something that we could not do because that would be a conflict. Next. Um, I'm gonna, cause I'm seeing my time. Um, the home studies, just FYI, um, home studies are, are one of the things that the nurses would ask is, well, what about these people that are adopting the baby? How do we know that these people are good? I can promise you the home studies that these folks go through are extremely extensive. Um, they have criminal backgrounds done. They have CPS backgrounds. They have psychological um, backgrounds done on them. Um, by the time they have been put forth to be potential adoptive parents, um, I can tell you that they have been screened every which way they can. And um, I, one of the things I often said to the nurses were that these adoptive parents, when you think about it, are screened a hundred times more stringently than just the normal mother coming in and delivering on the floor. So I had a lot of faith in this process. Okay, next. Um, well, I'm gonna leave some of these because I'm watching the time. Let's just go to the next one. Um, open and closed adoption, as I said, most adoptions today are open. Um, and meaning that the birth mother can, and the birth parents, and even maybe the birth um, family, if that's what the adoptive family agrees to, they have some involvement in the child's life and involvement can look a lot of different ways from just receiving pictures on birthdays to maybe even visits in a park or something like that. And again, um, I think most of the adoptions today tend to go more on this end of the spectrum. Um, and again, this is something that it starts out more frequently initially. And then as the birth mother moves on with kind of her life, then um, it becomes less frequent. Okay, next. Nancy, we have a question. Oh, so, I'm sorry. That's okay. One, uh, somebody wants to know, um, you mentioned that nurses um, 
on the floor can't adopt the baby, but we often hear of nurses adopting um, in the media. So is that just, can you explain kind of what happened? Um, they can't adopt, what, when they would ask me about adopting, they were talking about adopting, like literally, can the baby go home with me? So what I would, and, and you can understand why that would be a problem if down the road, the mother said, well, I felt like I was coerced by this nurse into her adopting my baby. What I would do with the nurses that came to me about that was I would direct them to go through the process to become potential adoptive parent. Um, and then at that, but is whether they could adopt this particular baby for this mother who was on the floor at that time. Um, I had was approached by nurses probably 10 times about doing that. And I was something that we could not do. So if you hear about it nationally, it, it's probably more in the perspective of they went through a process. Um, and, and I don't know what happens other places, but I can speak to Texas. I would be, you know, really surprised though uh, if nurses were able to just adopt off the floor in a hospital. Just well, most hospitals have very strict policies against that. It's considered highly unethical and I'm um, total conflict of interest. And the I know that for our attorney has um, cited several cases where not just nurses but doctors have gotten involved in. Uh, personally adopting an, an infant from the hospital and those are pretty big cases and it doesn't end well for the hospital or the doctor usually. Yeah, it's just well and because because there is a power differential, you know, and, and when a mother is delivered and she's in a very emotional state and if you have someone in power position telling you that you're going to be a crummy mother and this child's going to have a horrible life and you can understand that that would be very unfair to the biological mother. Um, private adoptions, these are the ones that do not involve an agency adoption. They're typically where adoptive parents know of like the friend of a friend's daughter who was pregnant. They do um, have an, an intermediary, typically an attorney that does the paperwork. Um, there are strict laws that you cannot, if a biological mother comes into the hospital, and I've had this situation where they didn't understand why they couldn't just decide to give their baby to their friend. I can't raise it, but I'm gonna give this baby to my friend, Carol, and we have this arrangement and you don't need to be involved. I had to be involved at that point because I knew about it. Um, in Texas, you can't just give away your baby because the idea is, is that, um, we're not sure of the situation. We want to make sure that babies are in a stable, safe environment. And so you can't just give your child to another individual without a court consenting to it. Um, and proposed adoptive parents in these private adoptions, um, they can't, they're not paying for the baby. They can only pay reasonable medical, legal, and counseling expenses. Um, and the law is very, very stringent about um, what they can and cannot pay for. Um, and again, with the private adoptions, there is rarely um, the counseling aspect prenatally and more importantly, postnatally. Okay, next. Um, I'm gonna go through this because let's go to the next one. My time. Um, as far as we, when mothers would come in and they were deci decided they wanted to place their child for adoption, but had not started working with um, any adoption agencies, I developed, um, one of the things I did when I first came to the hospital is I reached out to the adoption agencies and met with folks, representatives from there, um, so that I could get a feel for them and what services they offered. And I would put together a list that I was able to provide um, to the birth mother. And then, of course, um, and included in those would be, you know, ones that I knew that had strong ethics and had a good support system and where they really were above board. That, um, so I was very careful about that because basically I was giving an endorsement of these adoption agencies. So I was very careful about um, what names that I would put on that list. And Yes, most adoption agencies have places where they would get folks, have folks where they get phone calls from 
social workers at the hospital that, hey, I've got this mom and she's decided she wants to place her child and can you come to the hospital? Um, and so um, fortunately, you know, most adoption agencies, including Gladney, have that service available. Okay. Next. So the role of the social worker is, plays in the process. I've really briefly alluded to it. It's meeting with the, I would always tell the nurses that um, the most ideal time to make a referral to a social worker in the hospital on the mother baby floor um, is in labor and delivery because, um, because typically labor and delivery stays um, are two days for vaginal delivery and three to four days um, for uh, C-sections. And so um, if you had a lot of, if you knew that someone was going to be placing their child for adoption, there's a lot of steps that had to be gone through. So ideally I would get the phone call from labor and delivery. We have this mom. She's indicated to us that she wants to place her, that she's placing her child for adoption. She's working with Gladney. Here's her, her um, caseworker's name and phone number. And then I would call the, the person from Gladney, for instance, and have them come in to start working with their um, patient, their clients. That's the ideal situation. Um, didn't always happen like that, as I mentioned. Um, the, for the mothers who just decided to adopt, I would try to get agency involvement as soon as possible. Um, I would assist the family, adoptive parents, because many times they have already been called and they're at the hospital and as I said, they're kind of a nervous wreck at that point. So giving them support. Um, sometimes if we had the room available, we would set aside a room for them to be able to bond with the infant. Um, one of the things that was very important in the labor and delivery was to find out from the birth mother the extent and the, the, the kind of contact that she wanted to have with the baby. Did, you want to, did she want to see the baby? Do you want, we had birth mothers who would breastfeed for the short time that they were in the hospital. Um, and then we had other birth moms who did not want to see the baby. And honestly, for them, I would just encourage them just to at least see the baby. And if not, I would take pictures for them. Um, but, and then other, at the other end of the spectrum, you had the adoptive parents, they were like, the birth mother would say, yes, I want the adoptive mother to be in the delivery room with me. And it was, you know, a different relationship and there was much more involvement. So my, you know, when in labor and delivery, part of what I was trying to do was just get a feel for what the dynamics were going to be during the hospital stay between all the parties that were involved and then assisting with the logistics and the support for everyone involved. Um, and in those instances where the mother, the biological mother did decide that she was going to parent, then I would do just a normal assessment to find out if she was going to be able to um, provide a safe, stable environment for the child. Um, many times if she had changed her mind, it was um, sometimes from, I had a situation one time where I had a teenage girl who was 16 and she was Hispanic from a, and had a very large family in the room. When I went to labor and delivery to meet her for the first time, there were probably 20 folks in the room. She'd already had a child when she was 15 and she had um, made a clearly, what was clearly a very um, measured decision to place this child for adoption, this next child, because she knew she could not raise the child and she lived with her parents. Um, it was a, about a three day hospital stay. And at the end of the hospital stay, she changed her mind about placing her child for adoption. Even though she told me that she knew that she was not the best option for the baby, but her father put enormous pressure on her because she was having a little boy and it was gonna be his first grandson. And basically he told her that if she did not, if she gave the baby up for adoption, if she gave the baby away to strangers, that he would kick her out along with her one-year-old. That's probably the case that stuck with me, has stuck with me the longest because she was making an extremely grown-up mature decision. And, and at that point, she, 
felt like she could not go against the wishes of her family. Um, but that also highlights that in some cases you have the birth mother alone and in some cases you have her own family there and they may not agree with her decision. And so there is also trying to navigate that as well. Okay, next. Nancy, we had someone make a comment and I just thought it was really sweet, so I wanted to read it. Um, from my previous experience working with birth mothers, I would ask her if it was okay to have a photo of her with the baby and the adoptive parents in the hospital so the child will see that everyone loved him or her from day one and even before. This photo also helps keep, uh, also helps the birth mother show those who want to know about adoption, how it really works, and she can be proud to show her with the parents and that she chose for that she chose for the child. I think that is so sweet. Yeah, that's that is really awesome, and that's you know it also highlights the fact that she is that child's parent, and that was the thing that was important about respecting that up until when she has to she decides to sign that affidavit of relinquishment, and she grew that baby for nine months and was trying to take care of herself to give that child the best life possible. And so honoring her as a birth mother and making a very sacrificial decision, um, of course, yeah, that is that is really a wonderful thing to be able to offer. Um, the, I've talked about the affidavit of relinquishment um, and the support that would go to the biological parents, helping the staff and the uh, feelings and emotions related to the process, doing on, ongoing um, training about to the nurses, and then ultimately to safeguard the rights and the safety of the newborn in, throughout the process. That first and foremost, my primary client was the infant. Okay, next. Nancy, we have another comment. Yes. What can an adoption agency social worker do to help in terms of connecting with hospital social workers, educating hospital staff, et cetera, to help the hospital run smoothly? Help um, the, the hospital well, run smoothly. Typically, I was, because I worked in a large hospital, I was a perinatal social worker, which is basically from uh, pregnancy up until the first year of life. And so I, that was my specialty. Um, I think it is important to reach out to the social workers in the hospitals because pretty routinely across the country, it's the social worker who is actually managing the process. Um, I'd make an appointment and go meet with that person. There is nothing like, and you know this from working in the community, um, there's nothing better than being able to put eyes on the people that you're going to be on the phone with if you're needing resources in the community or you're going to be working with different community agencies. And then offering to them, um, it, there may just be, depending on the size of the hospital, one social worker that covers every population in the hospital. And so, yes, that social worker may not be as well versed on what the process is. Um, and offering up training is excellent um, because nurses are always looking for training um, and doing some training for um, the social workers in the community as well. So doing, you know, a lot of times I would reach out to folks, but I love it. I would also get a lot of phone calls from agencies in the community. Um, and that's an important thing to do because I'm, I'm going to say this really briefly and I'm very aware of the time, but working in a hospital, um, we tended, it is very easy to think about hospitals as being big silos that have these impenetrable walls that May, and where you've got very two distinct camps. You've got the hospital and you have community resources. As a social worker, I really felt like first and foremost, my job was to be the bridge between the silo, to lower the, to lower the walls of the silo, so to speak, and extend out to the community. Um, so I always really valued having community resources come into the hospital. So I encourage you to reach out in your community to the to folks in the hospitals. And if there's not a dedicated social worker there, it would at least be a social worker on call. Because that is um, JACO, which is the big organization that governs hospitals, the accreditation hospitals. Um, they, this is a uh, guideline is that the social workers tend to be the ones to manage this process. Um, 
Nancy, okay. I know I know you're short on time, but um, kind of in that same vein. And what we can do is, if people can stay on for you to finish, then they can stay on. But okay. if you have to, if they have to leave after um, it's over, then then that's okay too. They would still get their credit um, okay. because they stayed the whole hour. But one thing I wanted to know from you as a as a hospital social worker, what are the, what would you look for as far as education or the top like say three things that you were looking for in a in an ethical adoption agency? What are some of the questions that you would ask or want to know? Um, well, I for one thing I want to know their um, how long they've been in the community. I want to know that they have a track record. Um, I want to know that they have the full range of services um, where they have folks that work with birth parents and folks who work with the adoptive parents. Um, I think it is important that that be two different people because I think that their needs are very, very different. And again, it just takes, uh, it helps with that, the notion of conflict of interest um, and then also that there is counseling that is available. Um, the counseling aspect um, is very, very important, whether it, you know, a mother, a birth mother can go home and six months later still be dealing with depression and everything that can be tied back to the adoption and being able to contact an adoption, that same adoption agency um, and have them still provide that counseling or provide a way for that mother to have count that birth mother to have counseling is really really important. So I look for longevity, um, a tr you know, a track record, um, having it be sufficiently staffed so that um, it's able to meet the differing perspectives, and to have a good um, pre pre delivery and post delivery counseling support. Thank you. Um, let's see. Uh, okay, next. Um, I talked really briefly about the private adoptions. The dual representation is a conflict of interest. Um, uh, we can go to the next one. So the confidentiality of the mother is should be respected. And again, this goes back to having a conversation in labor and delivery as to how involved she wants to be with the baby, whether she wants to have a Jane Doe attached to her name, um, just how private that she wants this to be. Um, it's important that uh, the only people that know about the adoption on the floor need to just be the nurses that care are caring for her. It really, just like with any clinical issue, the only people that need to know the, the social details of people's lives are the nurses who are caring for the patient. Um, hospital staff needs to take extra care to follow the mother's wishes regarding how much contact that they have with the baby. Um, we also don't, if, if there is a mother who has decided and thought through and doesn't really want to have very much contact. I had mothers that would want to actually be placed on a different floor so they didn't have to hear the babies being wheeled up and down. We need to respect that. We don't, it's respecting um, not only if they want to have contact, but not have contact. That both of those wishes are, are legitimate and they're for a var variety of reasons and it tends to be something they've thought through. Um, and um, until and well, and then another thing is until she signs the affidavit of relinquishment at 48 hours after delivery, um, all of the the decision making about the baby in terms of the baby's care um, are made by the birth mom. Now, um, typically, what has happened with adoption agencies is they have conversations with the birth moms to you know, for instance. A really common one is a the decision to circumcise a little boy. You know, let's say the birth mother feels this way and uh, or doesn't really care one way or the other, but the adoptive parents is this um, preference is not to have a circumcision. So hopefully that is something that you know has been discussed by them. 
but ultimately the birth mother can make any and all decisions and can make the decision to breastfeed up until when she actually signs the paperwork. Okay, next. Um, again, it, it's 48 hours, it is um, irrevocable. The 48 hours is to allow that any anesthesia or pain medications not be affecting her decision. Um, and the reason for doing that is because that is probably one of the reasons why there is such a low um, uh, low percentage of birth mothers who change their mind because they've had a period of time um, to make that decision. And um, when I would be working with the birth mothers, I would, these are cases that I would stay very involved with. Um, if the agents, even when they had the, um, the adoption agencies and they had the counselors coming into the hospital to talk with them, because I needed to be able to also document in my chart that, you know, mother has delivered her child, you know, she, you know, day two, she, birth mother has expressed a desire to place her child for adoption. Um, she is, you know, willingly making this decision. That is actually a safeguard, not only for her, because I'm clarifying with her, but for the process as well. Um, because at that point, I, and, and this is why it's so important of not, you know, having hospital members adopt babies and everything. My role is to be totally neutral. Um, I can't appear to be trying to coerce a mother into placing her child or keeping her child or anything else like that. So I'm the, the neutral person in the hospital. And it's also very important that the hospital be perceived in that way for anything that happens you know, down the road. Um, okay, next. So the role of the prospective adoptive parent um, while they're in the hospital um, should be determined by the birth mother, um, including the extent of their visitation and involvement in the hospital stay. Um, one of the things, um, you know, if these adoptive parents are first time parents, I would always make sure that the nurses did all the training of baby care basics and all uh, for the adoptive parents, just as if they, just like we did with all the biological parents on the floor, um, because of course they may or may not have practice with that. And so we would, they would a lot of times come in and spend time with the baby in the nursery and, and go through all of the training just as if they had, had the baby themselves. Um, again, the staff needs to be aware of their own personal views and not use the words really, really matter in these situations. Um, giving up your child evokes a much different feeling than placing your child. Um, and it's important that the birth mother be allowed to spend as much quality time with the child after birth without having circumstances of having the adopted family pressure her to make plans. And so even the amount that the adoptive parents are visiting the birth mother is up to her. In most situations, I saw a really wonderful, they had a chance to meet prior to delivery and had already, you could tell, formed a bond. And typically there was always a great deal of respect on the part of the adoptive parents, um, particularly with the adoptive mother and the biological mother, you could tell that there was already a rapport there. That was always a joy to see and a lot of respect still given to the biological mother. Okay, next. Um, so this has come up. So um, CPS versus adoption. So there are one of the jobs as a social worker in the hospital, basically at the end of the day, my role was to make sure that babies we're all going, whether there was an adoption or, um, let me close my door just a second. Whether it was adoption or um, just a, a mother delivering her child is to make sure that all babies were going home to a safe, stable environment. Um, there are times when I would have to do CPS referrals, which is Children's Protective Services because I did not feel like the mother was going to be able to safely take care of the baby. 
This could be for a variety of reasons. Um, she may have tested positive for drugs. She uh, may not, she may have a very acute mental health um, condition that would prevent her from providing a safe, stable environment. Um, it may be um, just, it's a whole variety of reasons of why we've had, we have to get CPS involved. Um, the, when, in those situations, and I, I think it'd be helpful to kind of explain how it works in the hospital. Um, when CPS is called at the hospital, um, at least in Texas, and I would imagine all over, is that they view, CPS views this as an emergent situation and they assign an acuity level to the um, case. And typically when it's an infant, they respond within 24 hours of coming to the hospital to assess the situation, um, figure out what is going on, figure out what they're going to do. In some instances, they take what's called emergency removal, which is where they make the decision that the mother cannot take the baby home and the baby um, is going to go into foster care um, while they um, try to rehabilitate the mother or a variety of things. Um, when I made CPS referrals, I didn't just back out of the case because I many times knew a lot more about the family or the, the circumstances and I knew why I was making that CPS referral. And so I would stay actively involved and um, was able to give a lot of information um, to the CPS workers for them to really, you know, figure out the situation that the baby would be going to. Um, up until when, and even afterwards, see, a mother can decide that, and I want to make sure that this is worded correctly. Um, as I said early on, it, my role was to make sure that mothers are able to make informed decisions. And in order to make an informed decision, that means to understand all of the different avenues that are open to them in this situation. And the reality is, particularly in a situation where CPS has taken custody of previous children and the likelihood of her taking this child home is very low, um, and in many cases, they've had to terminate rights because what happens in the process in Texas is that when, whether it's an infant or a child, CPS, when they take custody of a child, they give the birth parents up to one year to work through services to basically rehabilitate their homes such that they're able to parent their children or their babies safely. In some situations, they're never able to do that, and that is when they actually terminate rights. Um, I've had a couple of instances where CPS took custody because there had been three previous removals and terminations. And at that point, when I went in to talk with the mom, I did talk to her about adoption and held that out as, yes, that actually would be an option. And in that way, she could actually have contact with her child. This particular mother knew that she was probably not going to be able to get herself together enough to go and work the services again. She knew herself pretty well. And she was a mom that was in her late 30s. So she had at least some maturity enough to know that. Um, for these moms, and it, you know, being able to choose adoption, she actually has the control there. And that's the difference in, with CPS. Um, when CPS takes custody of a baby, um, the birth mother doesn't get to just decide, oh, a family member is going to take care of my baby. Um, CPS at that point is totally in the decision-making role. And so adoption can be seen as a way for her to preserve some control over the situation um, in terms of being able to choose who adoptive parents were going to be and what the situation was gonna be for her child, and even maybe possibly have some measure of contact with the child um, as they're growing up. Okay, next. 
Um, so this is again, can a parent make an adoption plan even after CPS is involved? Um, the, um, I, I think I've talked a lot about that. Um, choosing adoption allows her to have control over the process. Unlike when CPS is involved, um, it is no longer the decision of the birth mother. So just having this measure of control can be something that is, uh, can really make the change for that particular birth mother. Okay, next. Okay, um, I alluded to the feelings after placement. Um, again, when nurses would go into the room and mom would be crying, they would contact me and say, the mom is crying. That must mean that she doesn't feel good about her decision. And I would always say, well, her grieving the loss of her child um, even though she was the one making the decision, that is a very normal part of the process. Um, so grieving for, this is all of the stage, just normal stages of, of grieving. Grieving for what might have been um, anger, maybe at herself, um, or just uh, not really anger at the system, but angry at with herself at not being able to raise a child. Um, regret, even knowing you made the right decision doesn't mean that you, you can't, especially mature individuals, they have to make decisions where they put their children first all the time. It doesn't mean that they, they know that they're doing something they don't want to do. They would not want to do if they were just trying to meet their needs, but they're trying to make the right decision for the child. And then acceptance and, and peace that they did the right thing for the child. Again, I feel that adoptions are the most selfless act of parenting that a parent can make. Um, you know, the acceptance and the joy are things that we're not going to tend to see in the hospital because they happen down the road. Um, another thing, though, that I did is um, we had a screening tool that I developed at the hospital um, so that if there had been a, if this was a birth mother coming in, for instance, and having let's say she placed her child for adoption when she was 20 years old. You know, fast forward 10 years later, she's happily married in a good situation. Um, I would actually address, and the adoption was listed in her prenatal records. I would actually address that with her because um, some of those same feelings can bubble up with subsequent pregnancies and just the guilt over having done that. and um, and those kinds of things. So adoption is an important thing for us to know kind of across the spectrum, even 10 years down the road. Um, okay, next. So um, after the hospital, this is kind of what I had mentioned, um, in my private practice, I've had quite a few clients who are dealing with a lot of mental health issues that can be tracked back to um, adoption, them being adopted and having um, not knowing very much about their birth parents, or maybe the adoption wasn't handled in a way that gave them any answers. Um, most social workers encounter adoption issues in their work. Um, there are a hundred, there a uh, the gentleman that wrote the Adoption Nation estimated that 100 million Americans are touched by adoption. Uh, the US Children's Bureau estimated that 1.8 million children under the age of 17 were adopted. And of course, that does include children that have gone through the Child Protective Service Protection Services. Um, while most people who are adopted do not seek mental health services, there is a disproportionate, disproportionate, disproportionate number of adoptees who are represented in the clinical population. And again, um, hopefully we'll see this number go down um, because of the openness with which we, the process happens these days. Um, and then a lot, a lot of adoptive parents and adults who are adopted have reported being unable to find mental health providers who understand the adoption related issues in families. And so, even if you're not, even if you're a therapist or a social worker who isn't specifically working with adoption, I think it's important to have an understanding of the feelings and the dynamics because you will have clients that you're working with 
that um, this could be at the heart of issues that they're currently dealing with. So just understanding the dynamics. Um, okay, next. Um, I'm going to let y'all just read this. This is just um, when when the um, ideally the birth mom is well the birth mom and adoption agencies is choosing who she wants the um, adoptive parents to be. And I don't know if you've ever seen um, the portfolios that adoptive parents put together, but they are amazing. Um, they tend to have lots of photos in them and they're, they're in, you know, Jennifer can probably speak more to this, but, you know, they talk about hobbies. They talk about what their extended family look at. They basically are marketing themselves as a family so that the mother is able, the birth mother is able to place her child in exactly the situation that she wants them to be in. Um, Jennifer, do you want to have, add something to that? No, I think you did a great job. It's it's just the adoptive parents really want to make sure that they're representing their family in a way that um, I, I can speak to this on a personal level because I'm an adoptive parent. Um, for us, it was just we wanted to be authentic and show who we really are, but we also wanted to make sure that um, we were putting all the information that we could in this little profile book that would be representing our family. And so um, I'm always intrigued by what an expectant mom is looking for in a family. It's really different than you might think. It's not always, you know, the rich and the famous. It's in fact, it's rarely that they're usually looking for someone that either reminded them exactly of their family, if they had a good relationship and yeah. they're looking for something very similar, or if maybe they didn't have the best um, connection to their family, they're looking for what they wish they did have. Um, and so it's, it's always fascinating to me to see how birth parents and adoptive parents come together. Cause I do think it's a, I think it can be really beautiful because they're both coming together in joy and pain for different reasons. Well, in my, my experience too has been um, that the, I love the way, you know, when you realize for some of these birth mothers who have come out of very chaotic situations and everything else like that, I have seen real healing take place with birth mothers because of the respect that they're given by the adoptive parents who, you know, I mean, this is the most wonderful gift that you can give to a fam to a couple who cannot have children. And um, and there's healing that takes place, you know, because maybe this is the first in that birth mother's mind, the first time she, quote unquote, did the right thing. And, you know, she should be honored in that way. And so I, I, I have seen real, really cool things happen in the just the dynamics and the healing that takes place between um, especially adoptive moms and birth moms, because. Um, not that the dads don't matter, but that's where I think just um, the the real um, magic happens. I don't know. I just I don't know how to describe it. I, um, yeah, I totally agree. I also, I just want to also read a comment real fast that I didn't see until just now. Um, although CPS is not as liberal as adopting through a CPA, we do allow birth parents to have a say about who can parent their child. The potential caregivers have to pass background checks and they show that they can provide an appropriate home environment. Also, through mediated settlement agreements, parents have a say. Fortunately, we've learned and have moved away from those bad practices. Trainings like these definitely continue to contribute to making it better for us all. Well, thank you. Um, I do agree that education is the key to everything, and I know that CPS is doing some wonderful things as far as um, even with the with we have a group home for girls in foster care, and they have a big say in who they um, what kind of parents they want, and they can decline parents that are interested in them. And I know that's a practice that CPS does as well. So it's it's nice that we're all learning and growing together. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, next. Okay, these are just some suggested readings um, at the end. Um, are there any questions? No, I kind of zipped through that. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to be able to um, talk with you guys about this. I 
think adoption's a pretty terrific thing. Um, I will always, you know, forever in my life, think about some birth mothers that I've run into along the way that carefully made probably what is the hardest decision in the world to make. Um, and it's so ironic because folks think that it's something that is done and very casually and it, nothing could be further from the truth. It's one of the most selfless um, sacrifices that, and it may be their first and last um, act as a parent that they're able to do for this child. Um, but it's the most, one of the most selfless acts of that a parent can make for a child, so. Thank you, Nancy. And I'm so glad that you were here today. We had some great discussions. We were able to, um, uh, we were able to, oh, hang on. I'm not, my camera's not on. <laughs> uh, yeah. We were able to share some, some wonderful things together. And I appreciate that. Nancy will be back with us later in the year. She has some amazing, um, just amazing programs that we're looking at right now. But one of our favorite things is looking at disparities in healthcare and helping improve different outcomes for all women and babies. So maybe that's something that we'll touch on as well. We also have some great programming coming up on December. You probably saw me plug this. This, um, in the chat, but on December 10th, we're having kind of a, a virtual panel of Gladney staff so you can learn about our programs and our services. Yeah. Oh, did y'all hear my husband sneeze? <laughs> Um, and we also have some, I'm just um, booking some great ethics classes that's going to be about six hours. Um, it's going to be a two-day event with some really dynamic speakers. So we have a lot of really great things coming up. Please keep checking back, glidinguniversity.com, so you can learn all about what we have coming up. But I appreciate everybody's time. I know we went long this time, but there's just a lot of information to cover on this topic. It's something that I'm personally very interested in because we know um, from our our research at Gladney that a lot of trauma can happen in the hospital when you're planning adoption and so the more that we can educate hospital social workers and counselors about um, kind of what to do with an expectant mom and how to treat her which is just like any other mama in the hospital she has this is a special this will all always be a memory for her and um, the more we educate hospital staff on how they can make this um, the less traumatic, the better. Obviously, we know it's always going to be a part of her. So um, thank you so much for attending. And like I oh, Nancy wants to say, say one thing, too, yeah. um, because I know that you guys probably come from a different, a lot of different size communities. If you're in a, um, a smaller, in a community where there's a smaller hospital and you're trying to figure out, like, how to get a hold of the social worker, your best bet is to contact um, every um, maternal child health area. They they call it different things in different hospitals, labor delivery, postpartum. Um, they have a director, a nursing director. And if you reach out to the nursing director and say that, you know, we would really, I would like to be able to come in and do some staff training. Let me tell you, nursing directors love that, especially folks that come in from the community, um, especially on this topic, because in a smaller hospital, although to me, in a smaller hospital, there's actually more of a potential for things to go wrong because they don't do the process very often. And, um, you know, in a large hospital system like where I worked, we had a, a large, like 20 page document uh, protocol policy for the hospital that governed every aspect of this. Um, you would hope that most hospitals had that, or it may just be one or two lines in a policy, but um, there's just so many different size hospitals, especially in Texas, because um, we have 236 counties and most of those are rural communities. And that's going to be, that could be a 20 bed hospital, a 10 bed hospital. And um, if the woman lives in that community, that's where she's going to go and deliver. So um, feel free to reach out if she, because they love training. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Um, I appreciate everybody's time. And when you log off this, a little box will pop up and you can just fill that out and that's how you'll get your CEs. And if that doesn't happen and in about an hour, you'll get an email with the link. So um, I know you'll join me and um, thanking Nancy for being with us and she'll be back um, to be one of our another speakers later in the year. So you guys take care. Have a wonderful, wonderful holiday. Please stay safe. Um, and I hope to see you back. Thank you so much for supporting Gladney University. Bye. Bye, guys.